Good morning, everyone. The Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife will come to order. Subcommittee's meeting today to hear testimony on the state of water infrastructure and innovation in the Western United States. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at this hearing will be limited to the chairman and the ranking member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and keep members on schedule. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Well, thanks for joining us today for an important hearing looking at the state of Western water infrastructure and innovation. While water infrastructure is not something that always comes to mind, when people talk about our infrastructure and think about our infrastructure, the fact is water infrastructure is crucial to the lives, health, and economies of this country, uh, just as crucial as the roads and bridges that typically get discussed. Despite its importance, federal investment in water infrastructure has unfortunately not kept pace with our needs. In fact, while federal investment in roads and bridges has remained Roughly steady in recent decades, federal investment in water infrastructure has actually declined dramatically. According to the CBO, in the past 30 years, the federal government's contribution to water infrastructure spending has fallen from 63% of total capital spending to a mere 9% in recent years. That's truly regrettable and an unfortunate departure from previous generations. During the 20th century, our nation's policymakers recognized the need for robust water infrastructure investment, particularly in the West. During the 20th century, the Bureau of Reclamation constructed hundreds of large Western water infrastructure projects. These projects transformed the Western US from an arid and largely unsettled region into one of the most dynamic, vibrant, and economically successful regions of the world. Unfortunately, most of this, much of this infrastructure is now more than a half century old and nearing the end of its design life. Substantial investment will be required for the continued operation and maintenance just of this existing infrastructure. And beyond our existing infrastructure, significant funding will be needed for the construction of new 21st century water infrastructure. After all, our 20th century water infrastructure projects will not necessarily meet all of the challenges we face in the 21st century. Now, during the last century, the Bureau of Reclamation focused primarily on construction of new dams and canals. And while new storage projects will be an important element of future infrastructure development, it's clear we can't rely exclusively on new surface storage infrastructure to meet our modern water challenges, in large part because the most productive dam sites already have dams built on them. So we're going to have to diversify. The 21st century requires an all of the above water infrastructure strategy that includes climate and drought resistant projects such as desalination and water reuse, along with new groundwater recharge projects, stormwater capture, and well designed surface storage. Despite our clear need for an all of the above investment plan, we still sometimes hear people suggest that if you're not building new dams, you're not doing anything. 21st century water managers tell a different story. With help from federal matching funds, Water Smart and Title 16, which we'll be discussing today, state and local water managers have created over a million and a half acre feet of new water supplies in the last few decades. That's a lot of water. But for the past few years, these programs have been woefully underfunded. The president's re recent budget proposed a 71% cut for Water Smart. Um, it proposed a 95% cut for Title 16. And if we are serious about water supply reliability and resiliency, we have to stop these irresponsible cuts. These are infrastructure projects that we need to support and move forward. And instead of cutting these programs, Congress should be dramatically increasing our investment in modern water infrastructure. There's currently a backlog of more than $400 million for Title 16 reuse projects that have been authorized by Congress but remain unconstructed. Additionally, more than $500 million is needed to complete water reuse projects eligible for funding under the WIN Act. And this figure is only expected to grow. Simply put, Congress must develop solutions to address these and other funding shortfalls, and I hope this effort will be a bipartisan one. 
I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses today about our infrastructure needs and potential funding solutions that Congress should further examine. One proposal I'd like to explore further is the idea of turning the Reclamation Fund into a true revolving fund that can help finance our infrastructure needs. After all, this fund was created by Congress specifically to fund Western water infrastructure. And while receipts to the fund currently help pay for some of our water needs, unfortunately, Congress is not fully appropriating it. In fact, the Reclamation Fund currently has a surplus of $16 billion and growing. Fully utilizing this fund for its original purpose of water infrastructure development will go a long way toward helping us meet today's water challenges. I should note that meeting the water challenges of the 21st century will also require innovation on the part of water managers. And fortunately, so many of our water managers are already doing this. They're innovating in numerous areas such as advanced water reuse, forecast-informed reservoir operations, and cutting-edge research and development work on promising new technologies. I think the federal government must fully support and encourage this innovation, and I look forward to hearing more about that work uh, today and how Congress can better support these efforts. So with that, I want to again thank the witnesses. Today's hearing is about learning more about modern water management challenges and exploring how this subcommittee can help folks meet those challenges, and I look forward to that discussion. I'll now invite Ranking Member McClintock to speak for five minutes. Uh, thank you. The subcommittee meets today to consider the state of Western water infrastructure and innovation. Central this question is a simple proposition. What is better, abundance or shortage? The answer is so self-evident, it seems like a trick question. Now, according to the California Energy Commission for San Diego County, the mean cost of water differs greatly depending on the source. The most expensive way to produce water is desalination at the cost of $2,300 per acre foot. Water recycling costs $1,500. Importing water, $925. Groundwater, $737. The cheapest source of water is good old-fashioned surface storage, dams and reservoirs, at about $600 per acre foot. Surface water storage gives us nearly four times as much water for the dollar as desalination. Now, everyone agrees we need to produce more water infrastructure. The question is, for the same price, would it be better to get one gallon or four gallons? This sounds self-evident to most people, but we continue to see a drive to discourage dam construction, even tear down existing dams, while pouring billions of dollars into desalination and recycling that promises only scarce and expensive water for our future. Instead of storing California's abundant rainfall before it reaches the ocean, they prefer to spend four times the cost of storage to reclaim that water after it has been needlessly lost to the ocean. The last generation understood this, and it built dams and aqueducts that we still rely upon today. They did so through the beneficiary pays principle. The state and federal governments advanced money for construction that was then repaid by the users of the water and power produced by these projects. In the 1970s, we abandoned them, sometimes in mid-construction. Now, the good news for California is we still have an abundance of water. The Colorado River system has an, has an annual flow of about 14 million acre feet. The Sacramento averages about 25 million acre feet. Yet we store 60 million acre feet on the Colorado, that's four years of flow, and only 11 million acre feet on the Sacramento, that's less than six months of flow, losing most of the rest of that water to the ocean. Now, we keep hearing that climate change means less water. Well, that's not what we're actually observing. According to the EPA, annual rainfall in the contiguous 48 states has increased 17 one-hundredths of an inch each decade since 1901. That's two inches more annual precipitation over the last 12 decades. California receives an average of 200 million acre feet of water through precipitation every year. That's 4,500 gallons of fresh water every day for every man, woman, and child in the state. Yet under legislation soon to take effect, Californians will be limited to 55 gallons of water for residential use. There is no shortage of water storage projects that could be financed by the beneficiary pays principle. One example is Shasta. The Shasta Dam was designed to be built to 800 feet. It currently stands at 600 feet. 
That extra 200 feet would produce 9 million acre feet of additional storage, nearly doubling the water we could store on the Sacramento system. But a project to raise that dam by 18 and a half feet that would store 630,000 acre feet of additional water has been stalled for decades by endless environmental reviews. So I pose the question again, abundance or shortage? Now, we could spend $1.4 billion to raise Shasta by 18 and a half feet, or we could spend a billion dollars for another Carlsbad desalination plant. Shasta would yield 630,000 acre feet each year, Carlsbad less than a tenth of that, about 56,000 acre feet. And consider this, when water is drawn out of Shasta, it generates electricity, enough for about 710,000 homes. When water is drowned out of Carlsbad, it consumes one quarter megawatt for every acre foot of water. Now, in other words, and listen to this carefully, Carlsbad consumes enough electricity to power 250 homes in order to produce enough water for one home. Desalination and recycling makes sense where there's no other source of water. Perhaps future technological breakthroughs will make them practical even where there is an abundance. I certainly would like to think the entire ocean is available to meet our needs, but we sh and we should continue research. But at this stage of technology, and in a water-rich region like California, this policy borders on lunacy. Droughts are nature's fault. Water shortages are our fault. That's the choice we made 40 years ago when we discouraged construction of new dams. And we now have to ask ourselves whether we really want to live in an era of unnecessary, self-imposed water and power scarcity or restore abundance as the object of our water and power policy. We will uh, now hear witness testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but the entire statement will appear in the hearing record. So when you begin, uh, the lights on the witness table will turn green. After four minutes, you'll see a yellow light, and uh, that is uh, an indication that you should begin to wrap up. Your time will expire when the red light comes on, and I'll ask you to please complete your statement. I'll also allow the entire panel to testify before we start questions from the members. Uh, I will now introduce the witnesses, although I'm going to invite one of my colleagues to introduce one of our witnesses here today. Uh, our first witness will be Mr. Dave Egerton who is the Executive Director of the Association of California Water Agencies and is also appearing on behalf of the National Water Resources Association. In his role ex as Executive Director, Mr. Egerton represents 450 public water agencies across California, which together are responsible to for delivering 90% of the water in the state. Uh, then we will hear from uh, Mr. Vince Vincente uh, Sarmiento, President of the Board of Directors of the Orange County Water District in Fountain Valley, California. The Orange County Water District is responsible for providing water to two and a half million people while protecting the region's groundwater basin. Mr. Sarmiento is also a council member of the city of Santa Ana, California. Welcome, sir. And uh, then our, our final witness will be uh, Ms. Ellen Hannock. Welcome, Ellen. Uh, from the Public Policy Institute of California. Ms. Hannock is Director of, Public, of the PPIC's Water Policy Center and is an expert on water policy, climate change policy, and infrastructure financing. Uh, and then the penultimate or third witness uh, is from Idaho. And so we're gonna have the gentleman from Idaho uh, provide that introduction. Mr. Fulcher, you're recognized to introduce the witness. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing in the first place. This, uh, Certainly a hot topic in Idaho has been for a long, long time and, and very worthy of this time here today, so thank you for that. I would like to introduce uh, uh, Norm Simanko. Uh, he's a fellow Idahoan and just a, a, a longtime counsel for those of us who were in the legislature once upon a time and, and now here in a long distinguished history in this particular uh, arena. He is currently a water law practice group leader in uh, Boise, Idaho with Parsons, Beale, and Latimer and he has uh, more than 25 years of experience representing water organizations and, and uh, current uh, clients include the Quincy Columbia Basin Ir Irrigation District, which is uh, the largest irrigation district in the Columbia Basin Project, Family Farm Alliance, uh, a very large nonprofit. Uh, he also has a, uh, 
uh, a, a tremendous history just uh, with some of his other credentials. Uh, formerly, special counsel to, to Nampa Meridian Irrigation District, that's one of the largest projects in Idaho, and uh, previous executive director and general counsel for Idaho water users, so that's about 17 years, and I think that's where we met actually the first time. And past president of National Water Resource Association, a former member of Western States Water Council, uh, one last thing that is probably his best title, what I call, Mr. Chairman, one of the good guys. So that's uh, Norm Semenko. Thank you. All right. Mr. Egerton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of this committee. It's an absolute privilege to be here before you today. Um, I can't thank you enough for taking this issue on. I think it's absolutely essential that our water resource infrastructure be part of any discussion on, on infrastructure investments at the federal level. Uh, I, I bring the perspective as, as Chair, as you, as you recognized, of NWRA uh, representing the Western states and members uh, that deliver water for ag and municipal purposes to more than 50, member, 50 million uh, uh, people across this nation, as well as Aqua. And uh, our, our ability to partner at the local level with the federal government is absolutely, absolutely essential in being able to accomplish projects across the communities of this country. Uh, there is a, uh, I, I really f believe that, uh, you know, there is a solemn responsibility in our industry and it's frankly why I wanted to do this work because the decisions that we make today really aren't just about the people here today, they're about children that are not even here yet. And we have to be smart in the way we invest in our systems to make sure that we do not compromise their future. And so what we're talking about today really is uh, really critically important and, and uh, the reason why we're, we're part of this profession. Um, the need for our infrastructure, our aging infrastructure in particular, is immense. Uh, we have almost a trillion dollars in backlog of work across the nation that needs to be done. With all of those challenges with, the, with infrastructure, those potentially threaten the ability to continue to deliver safe, reliable, and affordable water supplies. And so with that, again, it, it's really critical that we are able to, to partner uh, at all levels of government to be able to uh, really to extend our, our local resources, our ratepayer dollars as far as we possibly can to get this work done. Um, and as you know, our, our rating in the Society of Civil Engineers is a D, unfortunately, in the status of our infrastructure. So we all recognize this is a tremendous need. Um, as well, it's not just in the built infrastructure, it's in the natural infrastructure. The status of our, of our forested upper watersheds uh, are at, at severe risk of catastrophic failure with the, with the, the mega fires that we're seeing and that jeopardizes our water quality and supply. And so addressing those needs as part of infrastructure and what the U.S. Forest Service road and, and bridge system to be able to care for the forest is absolutely critical as well. Um, I, I really uh, believe that, and it's really the practice of local water managers across the nation that we really try to invest in an all of the above approach, uh, using all the tools available us available to us to be able to provide for local water supply reliability. And that includes all the way from new investments in new surface and groundwater storage, uh, additional conveyance systems, uh, improvements there, as well as water recycling, uh, water reuse, the uh, desalination, uh, water use efficiency and conservation efforts, all of those, all of those as well as the natural infrastructure uh, require and, and deserve our continued attention and investment. Um, the, our ability to do that really is, again, it's, it's, it happens because we have partnerships at the state and federal level. There's so many things that, um, that this committee and Congress have done recently to be able to support our work, and we thank you for that. Your continued support for Reclamation's budget and their programs is essential for that. Uh, we really believe there are opportunities to build upon the successes of the past. As you mentioned, the revolving fund uh, concept to utilize the Reclamation Fund for that purpose, we absolutely believe that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it builds upon examples that we have with SRF and WIFI and other programs that really are getting important work done, and I'm sure you'll hear about some more of those uh, to follow. Uh, we're a safe investment. You, we're, we're very low risk of default, and uh, again, it leverages so much money at the lo local level. And as we know, that investment is, is a tremendous economic driver for this nation. Uh, about a, a one and a half billion dollars annually in, in reclamation investment represents almost $50 billion in total economic uh, value to the country. So. We definitely uh, believe that this makes sense from a, a whole host of reasons. Um, as well, we really believe that uh, in, in those smaller rural disadvantaged communities that having access to grant programs is extremely important to be able to, again, stretch those local ratepayer dollars farther when you don't have the rate base to be able to cover all of the capital needs. Uh, and as well, a continuing investment in innovation and technology, uh, particularly when we see that there's a tremendous opportunity with uh, the adv advancement in research around atmospheric rivers, for example, and our ability to reoperate existing facilities. 
Uh, Turlock Irrigation District is now achieving additional 150,000 acre feet of savings, uh, reoperating the reservoir based on that information. And that's what we can do uh, across the West to tremendous benefit. Um, lastly, I'd just like to, to thank you, Mr. Chair, for your, your leadership on the water rights settlement extension. Uh, that's a very important act to, to preserve those funds and protect reclamation funds. As well, as well for this committee, we certainly appreciate your support and title transfer legislation, which again would help in the financing of projects that need to be done. And lastly, I just want to thank you again. This is an absolute privilege and honor, and uh, we, we certainly look forward to working with you in this critically important effort. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Sarmiento for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member uh, McClintock and members of the committee. It's a pleasure to come before you as a president of the Board of Directors for the Orange County Water District. I'm also a member of the City Council in Santa Ana, California, and I request that my written statement be made part of the record. Uh, OCWD is located in Southern California, and we represent more than 2.5 million people. We provide groundwater to 13 retail uh, water districts and um, 13, uh, excuse me, five cities, one investor-owned water utility as well. Today's hearing focuses on the West, but it is vital to recognize Orange County as a microcosm of the global implications associated with changing climate. Drought, population increases, and other factors impacting water supplies threaten our quality of life and our economic prosperity. If we lack re a reliable supply of water, the impl impacts are dramatic and reverberations to our local, regional, state, and national economies are gonna be impacted. In Orange County, drought conditions are a way of life. Population growth within our region is expected to grow as water demands. The public health implications Contaminants like PFAS exacerbate the, da the danger to a safe and re reliable water supply. Since 2008, OCWD has operated the world's largest advanced water purification project, the Groundwater Replenishment System. The GWRS, nearly a $1 billion investment to increase local water supplies, uh, takes treated uh, wastewater from the Orange County Sanitation District that would otherwise be discharged into the Pacific Ocean. We use a three-step advanced purification process that consists of microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light. This purification process produces high-quality water that exceeds state and federal drinking water standards. A robust partnership with the federal government and the use of traditional and innovative approaches can effectively work to reverse challenges of water scarcity. GWS, the world's largest water recycling plant, is now an option that agencies across the western U.S and regions throughout the U.S. can use to address constrained potable supplies. This is the payoff from the federal assistance. If it were not for this subcommittee's commitment to water recycling, a $20 million Title 16 grant for the GWRS, it would have been questionable, jeopardizing our ability to leverage additional state funding. We thank you for your support in this uh, policy priority. This is why OCWD is a supporter of legislation currently pending before this subcommittee. H.R. 1162 that would invigorate Title 16 water recycling program, authorizing $500 million in competitive grants uh, and for the first time increasing project assistance to $30 million. Title 16 is just one piece of the puzzle. We must leverage investments in our existing technologies and infrastructure. For example, harnessing nature's gift of rainwater through the forecast informed reservoir operations known as FIRO. Relying on sophisticated forecasting can secure additional water supply. In coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers, we can replenish our groundwater basement uh, with stormwater captured at the Prado Dam in Riverside County. FIRO allows OCWD to make informed management decisions that expand existing stormwater program without jeopardizing public safety. We believe that an aggressive effort to implement a broad array of initiatives can respond to the water scarcity rely, uh, realities of today and into the coming years. In summary, this should include federal policies and programs that support conservation, water use efficiency, energy efficiency, research technology, demonstration, increasing the purchasing power of federal assistance through analytics and artificial intelligence, natural systems improvements, traditional approaches to funding infrastructure such as the State Revolving Fund Program, innovative financing such as the WIFIA, tax-exempt financing, uh, project approvals, and exploring desalination. Often we in the water industry tend to see innovation within the context of advancing technologies. OCWD has learned that a critical component of innovation is education. Future innovative solutions will depend on our citizens' understanding of the importance of innovation in securing our water future. 
This was clearly the situation when we successfully constructed and began operating GWRS. We urge you to provide adequate support of education needs going forward so that the public appreciates and better understands the value of our investments in water supply innovation. Again, OCWD deeply appreciates the opportunity to appear before you today. We look forward to working with you to advance the adoption of innovative solutions to our water resource needs, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you once again. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Semenko for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking committee member and committee members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's a, it's a special privilege as someone who began his professional career uh, sitting behind the congressman from the first district 30 years ago, uh, who was a member of this committee at that time, to, to come here and, and have Congressman Fulcher uh, now as a ranking vice member and member of the committee. It's a proud tradition for Idaho. Uh, it is, as the congressman said, a critically important issue for Idaho. Uh, has been for its entire history and I suppose will always be so. Um, I feel like the odd person out up here. Uh, the other three are from California. Um, <laughs> Full disclosure, I was born in California. A lot of Californians living in Idaho these oh. days. <laughs> <laughs> lived, lived there till I was 10, and before we moved, the A's had won the World Series three times, the <laughs> Raiders won the Super Bowl the day we moved, and of course the Warriors uh, won in 1975. So nobody's a bigger Bay Area sports fan in Idaho than me. Uh, go Warriors. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I had the great opportunity to do when I, when I worked uh, in Congress two years in the House and two years in the Senate was, uh, in addition to the then Interior Committee, my boss also worked for what was then the Public Works and Transportation Committee. So I learned both transportation and water issues in these halls. I grew up in North Idaho. It's not a huge irrigation issue area up there. So I learned those issues here. And what I learned about roads and bridges, taking off of the comment that you made, Mr. Chairman, is that that is vital infrastructure. And the takeoff point really in the United States was the Interstate Act in 1958. And can you imagine if our country rested on the highways that were built, on the sites they were built, as a result of the 1958 Act? Uh, highways and water are very similar. One we drive on every day and we're well familiar with, and the other one is kind of hidden and out of sight. But it's just as critical and just as important. When a road, when a highway, deteriorates, what do we do? We fix it. When a dam deteriorates, as John Keyes, the commissioner, used to say, we're building dams all the time. We're fixing up the dams that are debilitated, that are dilapidated. The 1902 Act isn't the end all and be all of water projects in the United States. It can't be. So when, we, when those roads deteriorate, we rebuild them. When they aren't enough for the traffic, for the population, what do we do on those sites? We enlarge them. We make them bigger, we add lanes. We do the same with water projects. We need to do the same with water projects. Shasta Dam was mentioned. In Idaho, it's Anderson Ranch. The Bureau is actively looking at and working cooperatively with the Idaho Water Resource Board in partnership and the Idaho Water Users Association and the space holders in that Boise River Basin to enlarge that dam. That's cost effective. What is innovation? Innovation is an idea that can actually be put into practice to provide goods or services for folks. So it can't just be an idea, it has to be cost effective and it has to actually provide goods and services. So back to the roads. What happens when the highways can't handle the traffic? We build more roads, we build new roads, we build connectors, we build uh, the, the, the great interstate system that we have. We build more dams, we build more facilities. If you're in the Columbia Basin Project, you got lots of water, you got Grand Coulee Dam, you got the John Keyes pumping plant putting water into Banks Lake, it's conveyance facilities. That project's authorized for over a million acres. Now it's done really well, up close to 700,000 acres, but we still have several hundred thousand acres to go working with the Bureau. So there it's arterials, it's connectors to make sure with the con canals and the conveyance facilities that we can provide the water for the additional irrigation. So, the idea that we can fix it all without new storage, enhanced storage, enlarged storage, uh, is just not reality. Can you imagine if in 1902 we didn't do what we did as a nation, or in 1958 we didn't do what we did as a nation with dams and with the highway projects? That generation did what they needed to do to make sure that we had adequate 
transportation and adequate water infrastructure for today. And we have to do that for the future. So the water challenges are significant. They are daunting. And while certainly water conservation and water efficiency and water transfers all play a place, water storage is critical. In Idaho, we would be in a mess without storage, not just because of the water we need for farming and for cities, and I did serve for five years on the Eagle City Council, I know those issues too, but for the Endangered Species Act. We had an agreement passed in 2004, the Indian Water Rights Settlement in Idaho, and without storage, we wouldn't be able to provide the water that's necessary for that agreement. Conservation wouldn't be able to do that. So I thank you for the invitation, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmanko. I was going to give you some more time because we don't count the time that you spend praising Bay Area sports teams. <laughs> that's, uh, thank that's, you. That's all freebie stuff. Um, so rarely. <laughs> Ms. Hannock, you're recognized for five minutes. Talk a little bit about all the different pieces of water infrastructure, both the natural infrastructure and the built infrastructure, and how to think about it as a system. So um, you made an analogy to transportation. I'm going to kind of make an analogy maybe a little bit to transportation or to energy when we think about what we're calling the water grid. And here's a, a picture, you know, broad strokes for California, but I think if you took any western state, you'd have... Uh, something, something that resembles this in some ways. Ours maybe is, is the most extensive. Um, so what you have on, on the left side is those, those circles are the big surface reservoirs. And the squiggly lines are either rivers or they're conveyance, aqueducts um, and, and canals that have been built to move water around. Now the, the other side is sort of the x-ray vision of underneath the, the soil, and that's the groundwater basins. Those are our main groundwater basins. And these really all work together. Um, and you got a, a good example of that in the Orange County case of where the groundwater uh, basin is used very actively, but that's true in a lot of places in the, in the West. And we really need, as I guess my big pitch to you is thinking about 21st century management, is thinking about how do we operate this more intentionally as a system. Uh, where we think about how groundwater and surface storage work together and the key piece of conveyance that connects them. And this, this system is in trouble now, uh, but it's also our best hope for the, the future. Um, where, why it's in trouble partly is aging, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair. So a lot of the dams in particular are over 50 years old in California, and I'm sure that's true in many other parts of the West. Some of our conveyance infrastructure is in big, big trouble because of land sinking, and actually some of our groundwater basins, actually most of the ones that are not in orange there, that are in different colors of blue, have not been managed intensively enough and carefully enough, and we, we're losing through groundwater depletion a lot of our reserves. Climate change is making this worse because with the hotter um, and more volatile precipitation that we're getting, uh, we're, the, the droughts are getting worse, that's encouraging groundwater depletion, and the storms that are coming are wetter in terms of more rain and less snow, and they're, they tend to be spikier, so that makes, puts a lot of pressure on our surface reservoirs. Uh, or the Oroville failure was a good example of, of the problems that you get with that. So my pitch to you is thinking about some of the priorities for updating and modernizing this grid. And one of the first pieces to one of the first priorities is to really think about groundwater more as a more active part of this grid, um, manage it more intensively and actively. The second piece is fix what's broken and expand capacity where it's needed. And I'm thinking very ecumenically about the expanding capacity. Um, it might be surface reservoir capacity. It might be conveyance. Actually, we think that's going to be a big, big piece of what's needed. But also infrastructure that you need to operate the groundwater uh, storage in a more active way as well. And then the, the third piece is really operate it up, update the operations. So we heard about forecast informed reservoir operation. There are also ways to manage the groundwater and surface water together better in order to get water out of the reservoirs in the fall to make uh, room, get, the, get that water into the ground, make room for bigger storms and wetter storms that we're getting in the, in the winter. So what can the federal government do? A whole lot. 
I'm, I'm going to just suggest three things. One is um, be a really active partner with the state and with locals on assessing what investments are needed and how to manage it better. You can see a lot of different colors there. That's because it's federal, state, and local parties that are all owners and actors. And if we don't do this well together, we're going to miss opportunities. The second is data. And this is one of those sort of boring topics, but it's really important. The forecast-informed reservoir operations depends critically on improved weather forecasts. Things like measuring evapotranspiration using remote sensing um, is really key. Stream gauges are key. These are all federal roles. And then the third is uh, bring groundwater more into the family of what the federal government cares about. And there are a lot of different ways that the federal government can help on that. Um, maybe in question time, I can give you some, some more thoughts on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much to our witnesses. And uh, we'll now begin questioning from the members. I'll recognize myself uh, for five minutes. So, uh, Mr. Sarmiento, I'd like to start with you, uh, talk a little bit about the Orange County Groundwater Replenishment System, because it is so unique and innovative. It's big. Uh, it serves 850,000 people. And uh, my guess is that it's a major reason why um, you and other communities in California recently emerged from the worst drought of record, uh, and our economy was still whole. In, in fact, uh, statewide, our economy didn't skip a beat. Um, so there, there are some things that the ranking member said in his opening statement that I'll, I'll probably need to uh, rev up the fact check machine and put out a statement. Uh, we are uh, on very different pages uh, when it comes to whether we should be focusing on building new dams and pretending that they're really cheap and easy to do or focusing on these cutting edge 21st century water solutions. And I'm very much in the latter camp. Um, my guess is that if there was really cheap, easy to construct surface storage that could solve your problems in Orange County, you would have done it. Uh, but you didn't. You had to do the really hard work of putting together, together a project that was hard to finance. Uh, you had different uh, partners in that respect. You had to overcome technical challenges because this is highly treated wastewater that you are uh, putting back into the potable supply. You had to overcome public perception issues in order to do that. Uh, and yet here you are uh, with what I believe is a, a showcase project and, and really a poster child for what the Title 16 program at the federal government can do to bring new supplies online. And, and so I want to just invite you to tell us more about that and particularly um, whether you think a project like this would have been possible without Title 16. Well, thank you for that question, uh, Chairman. And, and certainly uh, for us, it's a... Uh, it's a well-hidden secret in the county, which we wish it weren't, right? Because I think more people need to understand what sort of asset it is, not just for the, for the county, but the state. And I think, um, you know, to your question, would it have been built? It probably may have been built, but in, over a much longer time. The, the um, support through the Title 16 funds, which was 20 million, obviously the cost of the project was much, much larger, but that I think gave us the credibility and the viability to introduce um, you know, state and the private sector bond market to support us. If, um, if the federal government wouldn't have been a partner with us on this, I think even the public perception would have been different. I think the public had obviously to overcome that challenge of understanding that their wastewater was gonna be treated and somehow injected back into the groundwater so it could be used as a supply for them. So I think all of this comes into the perception issue, and I think those challenges were difficult. One of my colleagues calls it the yuck factor that we had to get over. So, you know, a lot of folks were calling it toilet to tap. We always try to move them over to showers to flowers, and I think that sold a little bit better. But I think more than anything, it was the partnership. I think it was the relationship between the federal, state, and locals, and the private sector uh, believing in this. And for us, um, I represent a very, very um, disadvantaged community in the county. So unlike the perception of Orange County being completely affluent, Santa Ana has some of the lowest AMI in the state. It's one of the most densely populated cities in the country. And so our rate payers are extremely um, rate sensitive. So to the extent we could provide them with safe, high quality water that is not going to affect their rates and is going to keep, keep things stable for them, it was a big deal for us. So certainly Talk about the drought resiliency uh, aspect of this project, because 
uh, as the rest of the state uh, was seeing zero allocations from major surface water and, and conveyance projects as the Colorado River uh, assets were drawn down to record low levels. Uh, and I, even in my district, in, in the northern part of California, which we think of as being uh, wetter, uh, communities were running out of water, dr drilling emergency wells. Uh, talk about how that was different in Orange County. Well, as one of the witnesses was saying, we're blessed with this groundwater basin that we have. And so we receive and we use 75% of our uh, water supply for our folks in the county from the groundwater basin. So we only import 25%. The GWRS isn't a drought resistant or, uh, or something that prevents drought from affecting us, but it really reduces the impact. So we didn't feel it as much as other communities did, as you said, that had to go into allocations and very difficult moments, I think for us, managing it a little more careful, uh, reducing the pumping, making sure that uh, we were able to manage it intelligently, I think prevented that scarcity. It prevented the, um, the fact that folks were worried about wh what their reliability was gonna be. So I do think that had we not had the project, had we not had the GWRS, I think panic sets in and it makes it a much, much more difficult thing. Thank for you. Us to manage. Uh, recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you. Let's uh, start with the question of financing. Mr. Egerton, uh, it used to be we wouldn't rob St. Petersburg to pay for St. Paul's water system. All of our water projects were based on the beneficiary pays principle. In the case of the California uh, State Water Project, it was entirely financed by revenue bonds or self-liquidating general obligation bonds that were redeemed by the people who uh, paid for the, the water and power that these projects developed. Uh, the federal government advanced money uh, for projects and then was repaid for them. Isn't that the sound way to, to, uh, to finance our water projects? Thank you, Mr. Ranky Chair. I really uh, appreciate your, your, your question. It is- I uh, chat. I mean, we need to get to the point. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I mean, it, 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 uh, looking at it from a local perspective, we need a, a broad suite of, of tools available to us from the federal government. It's just a, and it, unfortunately, the, 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 the question is how do we finance them? Mr. Sarmiento, uh, why should the federal government rob St. Petersburg to pay for Orange County's water system? Shouldn't water, Orange County's water system be paid for by the people who use Orange County's water system? You know, and I think, we, I think it does uh, uh, ranking And, and th that would then provide accurate price signals to both producers and to uh, consumers uh, as, as to, you know, what is the, the, the cost of the water that's actually being produced. Would it not? Yes, and, uh, and I know that the federal government's assistance was a portion of that, and the state and the locals and the private sector paid for most of the project, but I think it was that initial gap funding, the initial funding that was really critical. Uh, well, critical while we're at it, uh, I'm, I'm told that the uh, uh, MWD of Orange County uh, did a study on its Poseidon desalination plant, uh, and uh, according to that study, under every scenario, concluded Poseidon is the most expensive and most financially risky of the alternative water sources eval uh, 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 evaluated. Why should we put money paid for by federal taxpayers into grants to pay for a project that uh, Orange County has concluded doesn't make any sense? Uh, yes, and, and, and to this point, uh, ranking member, we have not. We're still studying the whole uh, idea of making sure that we understand desalination, its cost and its effectiveness. Ms. Hanneke, it was suggested that we've run out of uh, uh, suitable dam sites, but I'm looking at just three. Uh, finishing Shasta to, Shasta to its full design capacity would add another 9 million acre feet to the system. Uh, finishing Auburn would raise uh, another 2.3 million acre feet for the system. Uh, the site's reservoir, 1.3 million acre feet. Just those three projects alone total 12.6 million acre feet of additional water storage, which is more than double what we currently store on the Sacramento system. Uh, shouldn't we be first constructing the least expensive uh, projects before we start putting money into the most expensive projects? So what I can say to that is that uh, Water users, I mean, the, the, the beneficiary pays idea is a really important one. And um, I think for agriculture, which is the, the main beneficiary of Shasta, um, that's something that the folks are actively looking at kind of relative to 
But my, uh, my other point options. is, we've got three in California alone. Right. We've got three surface water storage projects. Mm -hmm. Two of them are simply completing dams that we began and abandoned in mid-construction. The third is the Sites Reservoir, which has been been studied for many, many years. That those three projects by themselves would more than double our storage capacity on the entire Sacramento system. I'm not sure about those numbers, sir. But I but I, I will say that some of the new surface. Well, those, those storage that folks are, are talking numbers. about. They've been reported for, for many, many years. Those are, the, the, those are the, uh, the, the projects we're talking about. 18 feet on the Shasta, which is the current proposal, uh, would add another 630,000 acre feet of storage to Shasta, and yet that's been stalled for decades. Mr. Simanco, uh, again, doesn't it make sense to, to uh, uh, first exhaust our least expensive options before we start pouring billions of dollars into our most expensive options? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, in the United States, we have a long, proud tradition of deferring to the states. And in Idaho, for example, uh, that's what the Idaho Water Resource Board does. They identify the best water resource projects, and those include large storage dams or adding additional capacity to storage dams. So uh, absolutely, uh, and that, that's something that, that happens when water managers work in cooperation with others. What, what do the uh, uh, compliance costs add to the actual construction costs of a dam? Well. It's crazy. Uh, there are projects that we don't even look at, not because they aren't practical or cost effective, but because the maze and the gauntlet of federal environmental regulations, whether it's NEPA or the Endangered Species Act or Clean Water Act, threaten lawsuits. Even, even the murmur, the hint uh, of a lawsuit stops projects from being considered that otherwise should be going forward. So I can't quantify it for you without an example, but it's astronomical. And just the idea that you have to go through that maze and deal at the, at, the, at the tail end with litigation, uh, it's, it's uh, paralysis by analysis. Okay, thank you. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. Cox for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, there's probably no place uh, in the United States that feels the impact of lack of innovative water infrastructure investments than the Central Valley of California. Uh, and certainly with our increasing population in the West, frequent droughts, uh, there's just no time to waste, and it's crucial for the uh, Bureau of Reclamation to invest in 21st century water infrastructure projects, such as groundwater storage, recharge, and water use efficiency projects. Uh, certainly in my district, in California Central Valley, everyone from our farmers ranchers, and most importantly, our rural communities have been severely impacted by the ongoing lack of water supply and access. And water supply and infrastructure is an issue that affects every other issue. You can't talk about health care without talking about the lack of access to clean, fresh drink water. You can't talk about job security without talking about a reliable water supply and long-term water storage. Uh, the, rea the reality of it is our way of life is completely determined by the access and reliability of clean water. And so, Mr. Uh, Egerton, several weeks ago, this committee heard from a witness from the Central Valley of California who is here to talk about ensuring access to safe drink water for all. And I'm encouraged uh, to see that ensuring access to safe drink water to disadvantaged communities is a main pillar of your uh, all of the above approach. Uh, and so in your opinion, a few things, what steps should we be taking to ensure that safe drink water is available, available to everyone, regardless of income? Uh, and I'm sure you know about all the gaps in infrastructure coverage for rural communities. Uh, can you tell me more about the need for matching grant programs in rural and low-income communities? And finally, uh, you, you touched on it uh, in your remarks, but I, I'd like you to expand about the quote, quote, perceived surplus in the reclamation fund. Why does it exist, and how can we best utilize that resource to uh, get some of these projects done? You bet. Thank you very much, Congressman. Uh, the, the, the need for uh, continued investment in, in, for safe drinking water for disadvantaged communities is an extremely important issue that our, uh, particularly ACWA, is working on very ardently this year and has been for some time. And the, the work through this committee and through Congress is fundamental to that and having access to funding and financing that can be used to build the infrastructure necessary to deal with some of these, these challenges in, 
in some of these uh, communities. Uh, that's one aspect of it. If there's a continuing uh, need to find sustainable funding for the O&M side of it, and we're also very invested in that. But uh, the access to loan forgiveness, for example, for uh, dis severely disadvantaged communities, I know from my experience in Calaveras, uh, that through the state revolving fund program was critical for us to be able to do projects in some of these uh, really economically uh, disadvantaged communities that needed improvements that were vitally important for them. Um, so I think there's a lot we can learn and model from that. But uh, the, the, the need to, again, leverage those funds, I think the Reclamation Fund, as you mentioned, is a, is a really important resource. I mean, those funds have been collected over time through the realization of revenues on, on public lands for minerals and other, other uh, assets. It's also through payment by contractors. Uh, in, in revenue generated in, in power production. And so um, those funds, as they're deposited, as we heard, there is a surplus of funds. Any way that those can be utilized to better uh, assist in getting projects off the ground, that is key. And uh, because I think, as, as uh, my colleague mentioned, the validation is equally as important to the actual financing. It gives tremendous strength to local agencies to be able to make the case to the ratepayers that we, we need to sacrifice, we need to potentially raise rates, we need to invest in these projects because we know that these are recognized as critically important at the state and federal levels. And lastly, I'd like to note your, your, your area of the Central Valley is up against it, certainly with Sigma. Uh, we are absolutely dedicated to, to working on trying to find additional investments in surface storage and conveyance to try to deal with that because what it could, dev the devastation to our communities if those lands uh, have to be taken out of production to the level that has been uh, noted is, is, uh, is catastrophic and that would further compound the problems in disadvantaged communities. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen. All right, uh, Ms. Napolitano is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to harp a little on Title 16, my favorite subject. Uh, as you are probably aware, uh, we sent a letter to the Bureau of Reclamation some over 10 years ago, thanks to Dave Wagner in the audience. David, thank you very much, sir, for your help. Uh, and we have managed to increase the funding through the years on Title 16 to create more water. Uh, this current administration is cutting it 95%. What would that do to some of the projects you have? Anybody? Thank you, and, and uh, Congresswoman, I think for, for us at the Orange County Water District and specifically to our groundwater replenishment system that we have our two and a half million folks in Orange County depend on so vitally, it would have made it very difficult to get it off the ground. It would have delayed it, and that would have been um, you know, a problem unsolved for many folks. And with the droughts that were coming before us, it would have been very difficult for us to uh, continue to provide a safe quality alternative and an option for us to go ahead and replenish and recharge our basin. So it, would, it, was, a, it was a vital first step for us to be able to accelerate the process inform the community and get the project built as quickly as we could. Anybody else? I'd like to introduce a copy of the letter to the file. Uh, Without objection. Then uh, I introduced a bill to increase to 500 million. Do you think that'll help some of our agencies create more water to uh, counter any of the uh, drought cycles that uh, any of the seven Western states might get? Yes, Congress Member, we so appreciate your leadership on this and, and the continued investment and in, in increased investment in, in Title 16 and, and uh, recycling efforts is enormous because the, the leadership that Orange County provided is just setting the, the path for additional projects to move forward. Uh, last night at our conference, we heard about Metropolitan's efforts to joining with uh, with uh, Los Angeles uh, Regional Sanitation to further further develop those resources. And so, again, the, mod, the experience of Orange County is, is exa the example that's played out in, in communities all over the country, and that these access to these funds is, is so important to getting those projects off the ground. Well, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, if you were to establish the one million acre foot new water program, would grow new water in the state throughout the state create in the next 48 to 60 months, one million acre feet of water. Now, that, that would seem the prudent thing to do instead of uh, trying to find dams to uh, operate on, which will take a billion years and a lot of money. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, the recycled projects are a cost-effective solution to drought management? 
They're a, a very important part of the equation, and, and the, the, uh, the reliability of that water supply, particularly in dry times, as the, as the chair mentioned, are, is exceptionally valuable. Uh, so it's, it's not the singular answer, but it's a critically important part of it, and, uh, and it has to be part of the strategy. Well, Orange County has done a very credible job of uh, uh, doing recycled water. I went and drank some of it a few years back. And I'm sure that they're working on expanding it like uh, it is on, on our area. Yes, Congresswoman, we are. We're, we're going through our final expansion. Um, you know, we've been blessed with your support through the, the first expansion. And now uh, we're doing 100 million gallons a day. We're going to be doing 130 million gallons a day. What does that do to drought proof you? It, it's going to be able to provide um, water to um, a million folks. Right now we do um, 850,000 people in, in, uh, in our service area. We'll have a million. So, so without that recycled water uh, projects help with the federal government getting involved, would it have been possible to do what you're doing now? It, it would have been very, very challenging and very difficult because that buy-in and that support and partnership from the federal government was able to bring us um, the ability to leverage that support with our state partners and with our private sector partners as well. Thank you. Ms. Hannock, uh, um, uh, there are many overdrafted areas in, uh, in, uh, in California. Do you think this rain helped at all? So th this rain has helped a lot in that um, folks are trying wherever they can to capture some of the higher flood flows and get that water into the ground. But there are a lot of things we need to do to make it easier to take advantage of these opportunities. Well, uh, according to your map, there's a lot of uh, areas that are still overdrafted. And will they continue to be overdrafted, or are they going to provide water from the rains? They're, they're going to, when you think about overdraft, that's a long term problem. And so we need many years like this and m many efforts to get more water back into the ground. And groundwater recharge is one of the, one of the effective ways to do that, but it's, it's not the only tool. Precisely, that's what uh, we, we wanted to hear. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lamborn. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing. Uh, Mr. Simanco, last week in the hearing on the Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan, Commissioner Berman stated that, quote, it would be very difficult to see how the Southwest could thrive or survive without the storage we have seen on the system, unquote. How can we better prepare ourselves for upcoming drought years? Well, Mr. Lamborn, uh, my recollection on the Colorado River is, is they are able to store about twice the amount of the average flow, around 15 million acres acre feet compared to 7 million. So obviously one of the things you can do is try to improve the yield and try to have as much storage as possible. Uh, but overall, from a macro sense, it's not rocket science. More water comes down during the winter and the early spring, and you need to make every effort to try to capture that. Uh, one of the other things, probably the most cost-effective uh, water supply that we have is sitting in reservoirs right now, but because of flood control curves that are way too conservative, for example, at Ryrie Dam in, in Idaho, there's water sitting there, 36,000 acre feet, I think the study says, that's readily available if we would just not evacuate it for fake flood control that really isn't needed. So looking at flood control curves throughout the basins, including I'm sure the Colorado River Basin uh, would be a good way to do it. And then also uh, recharge was just mentioned. Uh, we've we've uh, started prolific efforts at recharge in Idaho because uh, our, our primary supplies, in many cases, are natural river rights. We use a storage supplemental after we run out of natural flow. If you can enhance that natural flow by putting water in the ground during the spring, the fall, and have that manifest itself in the river, you, you then have less reliance on the storage. You can save it, do other things with it in, in the dry years. You're touching on some great things. What about new water infrastructure? And do we have federal policies that are making that too difficult? Well, I think I've made it clear. I don't think we have a choice. And, and the truth probably lies somewhere between the opening statements of the chairman and the ranking member. They're, depending on where you live, you know, things are different and different solutions may work. But there is no doubt, just as in building the highway system in the United States, you've got to have highways. You've got to have new and better highways. You have to have expanded highways. The, the workhorse of our system and reclamation is the storage reservoirs. We have to fix those reservoirs. We have to, where it's uh, practical, enlarge those reservoirs, and we have to build new ones. The impediment isn't the reality. The reality is we need that water. 
We need that infrastructure. The impediment is political, it's regulatory, and it's uh, lawsuits. So uh, at some point, we're going to realize as a society we have to fix these things. We have to do these things. The question is, are we going to do it? Thank you, thank you. Now, as you know, Mr. Smenko, my title transfer legislation was signed into law as part of Senate Bill 47. How does that bill allow for private financing for water infrastructure repair and replacement? Well, uh, Mr. Lambor, we appreciate that and, and the support of the committee um, in getting title transfer. In Idaho, we've had a, an awful uh, good number of title transfer bills that have gone through. We also have in Idaho what are called Carry Act projects. And this is before reclamation even existed where uh, private uh, actors could come in and build the dams and build the facilities. And you see in those cases, those privately owned facilities, they've got a lot more flexibility. They don't have to deal with regulatory red tape. They can do recharge, run that in their canals without getting permission because they don't have the Bureau of Reclamation ownership. You don't have uh, the, ability, the concern about the ability to, ability to pledge assets when you're the owner, uh, when you want to get a loan, when you want to do those kinds of things. So uh, you're, you're freed up from a lot of red tape and uh, you're more of the master of your own destiny when you own your own facilities. It's not for everybody, it doesn't work in every case, but uh, certainly we hear that and see that in Idaho uh, with, with uh, both the title transferred projects and those that have always owned their own facilities. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, and that, uh, I'll highlight that as something where there was good bipartisan effort to make progress that we could all get behind, and it, that, that's actually making a difference. Um, lastly, as we look forward to an infrastructure package, should one come forward, what should Congress do to address the regulatory paralysis by analysis more specifically? Well, that's a great question. And you know, without <laughs> you, stepping uh, 30 into a, seconds. <laughs> a, a highly partisan area, again, it is practical reality. It's just common sense. There are too many regulations. There's too much red tape. There's too many lawsuits. It's got to be boiled down. So. Uh, frankly, the president's efforts and previous president's efforts to look at the regulatory scheme and try to pare it back to common sense. Uh, we're still protecting the environment. We're not throwing that to the side, but we've got to realize that uh, we've gone overboard and the pendulum's swung too far. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my last second. <laughs> All right, the chair recognizes Mitch Costa for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the um, Importance of uh, sustainability on, on not just for Western states, but I would submit to our entire country and the world in light of climate change, in terms of water sustainability, I think is going to be one of the uh, biggest issues in the 21st century. And will ultimately be judged by how well, as I'm fond of saying, using all the water tools in our water toolbox, as it relates to trying to balancing these needs uh, in light of climate change uh, as we look at our water infrastructure and innovation. Having said that, um, the uh, California, in which water is always a challenge, if not controversial, um, is attempting to do something rather bold uh, as a result of legislation that was passed several years ago, which is uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and that is to try to get into balance or overdraft. It's not easy. It's challenging with a host of demands on that very important resource. Um, obviously, we've had a wonderful year of snow, 174% of normal in the uh, central Sierra, and uh, a lot of good rain. Uh, how the problem is, of course, is, is that without the ability to store that water, uh, to recharge and do some of the other tools that are in our, our water toolbox become difficult. Um, uh, Ellen, Hannah, you've done a lot of work with the Public Policy Institute of California. Would you care to comment on uh, your findings and suggest what you think the federal government can do to increase storage, groundwater storage? Thank you for the question. So uh, uh, just a few quick thoughts. One of them, um, looking at the, the Bureau of Reclamation, which I know is the, the purview of, of, of this um, committee, there are parts of the Central Valley Project that now do actively work with groundwater and surface water together. And I'm thinking of the Priant Project in particular where water's made available to, to recharge in suitable areas. No, and we're doing the, gen, the GSAs as a part of the Sigma to right. complement how we, what so, our, the degree of our overdraft is and how we use different tools to Right, so I th what it. I think the, with the, where the Bureau could be helpful is making 
just being more flexible on where folks can recharge water that's, that's suit, uh, in suitable places. And this is a constraint even in the Friant system, but it's a constraint more generally where you've got uh, water that's available in a short amount of time and you got to get it on the, into right. the ground. And right now those rules are, are not as flexible as they could be. One of the things I'm looking at doing, I'm on the Ag Committee as mm -hmm. well, and we passed the Farm Bill in December, uh, and there are uh, a, a host of uh, funds, I think, that are available under the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service for voluntary conservation programs. And I'm looking at trying to expand that effort with regards to environmental quality incentives program and regional conservation partnerships. Uh, how can we better use this money, uh, as you said in your testimony, to help spur, spur innovation? So one of the best ways to get a lot of water into the ground quickly when you've got a lot of it in a year like this, and I would say this is beyond California is relevant, is to spread it on suitable cropland. And right now, the best partner for doing that is USDA, but groundwater depletion is not currently recognized as a, a resource con concern. No, and I want to try to change that. That would be great for <laughs> the West more generally. And then the, the other specific thing is as a resource management practice, having managed aquifer recharge be one of those practices would make it possible for NRCS to much more directly support those kinds of projects. Are, are you familiar with a, a farmer in my area by the name of Don Cameron? Oh yeah, I know yeah. Don. <laughs> he works with the Environmental Defense. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would suggest at some point if we continue this testimony, uh, we consider bringing him in as a witness. Uh, he has done some very innovative work uh, in terms of groundwater recharge um, on a host of the diversity of the crops he grows. And uh, he, as I said, has been working with the e Environmental Defense Fund and, and um, I think he could shed some light on innovation and how we, we try to deal with this. Um, our friends, I've got 26 seconds left, Mr. Egerton, um, worked with Aqua for many years. As we deal with the competing challenges, both of urban water use and rural water use and the demands on the environment, where do you think Aqua is coming in terms of how we try to do that balancing act? Well, it's, it's certainly, that, that's why in large part we are so supportive of a comprehensive investment uh, across the board for multiple benefits, human and environmental. Uh, really the co-equal goals of the human and environmental needs around our water resources have to be central to decision making on it. And, uh, you know, I, I think again, as you mentioned, Sigma is, is one of the most, maybe the most important area that's playing out right now in our state and why we are so close to it and making sure that, again, the, the most the most impactful and hurtful imp results of that are not are not borne by communities, the environment, others as we as we see land taken out of out of production. When we may be able to find other alternatives to bring more water into play to help with that. Yeah, my time's expired, but I think you hit upon some key words here in terms of the uh, uh, unintentional consequences, which is taking land out of uh, out of production. This is difficult. I think we need to, to be focused on how we implement it in a way that demonstrates common sense. And so we'll continue to work with you. And Vincente, my time's expired, but I do have some questions I'll submit to you later on. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Thank recognizes you, Mr. Mr. Lowenthal for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, panelists, for all being here uh, on this uh, water infrastructure and innovation hearing. I want to turn to Mr. Sarmiento. Good to see you again. Uh, the Orange County Water District has long been an innovation leader in water management, looking at a number of the important items water management agencies must adopt for the future, recycling, groundwater storage and recharge, as well as data collection and monitoring, Orange County's water district has not only been doing these, but, has seen, but is seen generally across the nation as a best practice in these areas for decades. You know, I've long been impressed with the work of the Orange County Water District and your cooperation with the Orange County Sanitation District. My question is, what's been the public's reaction to water reuse? And what lessons have you learned in your years as a leader in this area? 
Thank you for that question, uh, Congressman, and thank you for your support and this subcommittee support throughout the uh, 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 effort that we've made. Because it was uh, 10 years ago, we've um, you know celebrated our 10-year anniversary last year, so there was uh, quite a bit of a challenge initially to try to get the public support. Um, obviously, we were able to secure uh, the federal assistance, which was a very important first step to be able to present and roll out that information and engage the public. There was certainly doubt. There were certainly other options that were being uh, recommended that we should follow and not follow this path. 10 years later, 11 years later, we realized that this was the right decision to make and it was something that was very, very important. But I think it was engaging the public and informing and advising them what the science is. And I think the science was difficult for some folks to understand at first because it's counterintuitive that you're going to treat wastewater and make it as high quality as um, you know water that they're used to receiving. So there was a challenge there, but I do think having partnerships with the federal government, with the state government, and having the locals buy in and really engaging our public um, and our voters and our residents to understand that this is going to make a more reliable, a more uh, certain resource and uh, have one more, as, as we've all been saying, one more tool in our toolkit to be able to provide for our residents in, uh, in Orange County. Thank you. Mr. Sarmiento, you know, opponents to water reuse often bring up the cost uh, as a reason not to research this area or not to invest in it. Why did Orange County Water District decide to invest in water reuse over other potential solutions? Can you explain that to us? You know, I think, um, you know, given the initial investment, the number is obviously daunting and very large. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars of investment. But I think when you see something over the long run, over the long term, realizing that um, the viability of being able to um, import water exclusively from uh, the Colorado River, uh, having to bring it in from Northern California, I think what our folks really wanted was some certainty. And they wanted to know that they were going to have a system that they'd be able to rely on. And I think the, the, the investment that was made, not just locally, but again with our state and federal partners, made it more viable. And, and at, at this point, it's a very cost-effective way of delivering our system. We're blessed because we are able to, to partner, as you said, with the Orange County Sanitation District, which is literally right next door to our agency. We, we had a groundwater basement, which was a um, you know, perfect place to store the water, and we also inject um, uh, that uh, groundwater replenishment water into our injection wells to prevent seawater intrusion as well. So we were able to solve that problem, and we had injection wells already. So we had an infrastructure that was ready for a system like this, and I think our residents understood this was the right solution at the right time. Well, thank you. I have just one quick question for Mrs. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hannock, uh, as technology grows, what are the opportunities to tap into these resources and have a more technologically informed approach to water management? Thank you for that question. So one of the um, cutting edge ways that we can see this is with better, better weather forecasts and using that to be more precise about managing the trade-offs between keeping reservoirs empty enough to to protect people against downstream flooding and storing that water for, for dry years. And I think that's an interest that, that everybody else on the panel talked about. Um, we, we're starting to do that. We need to get better. Another key area is improving the ability to get real-time measurements. Um, and that's from stream gauges. That's from um, various ways from, from groundwater wells in order to manage our, our, our system more in real time. And that's something where federal agencies have been helpful. Thank you. And I, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. We're going to have a second round of questions for this excellent panel. So uh, Ms. Napolitano, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, going back to recycled water, uh, there are several things I'd like to bring out, and that is... Uh, Recycled water projects are the most cost-effective solution to drought management. Should other states start refocusing their investments toward recycled water? Yes, Congressman Member, that, I, it, it absolutely is part of the solution for other states. I mean, we're certainly seeing that in, in other areas uh, uh, of the Southwest. That that is a that's a for example, that's a clearly uh, 
tremendous, uh, you know, tool in the toolbox to help, and in, in particularly helping deal with the, the ups and downs of changing hydrology and year-to-year -year precipitation. Well, the, it covers uh, the western states, but um, maybe it should be considered in other states because uh, Mother Nature is certainly throwing uh, curveballs. Mm -hmm. It, it just it just makes all the sense in the world, and I think Orange County again is a, is a tremendous example of that in the partnership with our wastewater agency as well as uh, you know it's really maximizing the beneficial use of that water resource from beginning to end. Well, sir, in light of droughts and water shortages, why is it important we continue to support Indian water rights settlement? It's it's important because of those those collaborative efforts to, to reach the to reach an agreement have to be uh, the, it's necessary and uh, to be able to realize the 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 uh, the deal that is that is struck that again there can be very difficult to reach but having access to secure funding to be able to implement those over time and as well from the water community we find it uh, we think it's important to be able to protect other funds of, of reclamation and to make sure that there's a dedicated source of funding for the settlement so that we don't uh, th those other funds again many of which go to the infrastructure projects we, we we're talking about today are not are not uh, uh, used for other purposes yes uh, according to uh, mr. Kildee before the prior Mr. Kildee, he always maintained that Native Americans have the first water rights. And so I think we need to start uh, getting the word across that they have to have that water. There's still not enough water provided for them. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, let's see, the LA County, Mr. Sarmiento, uh, produces more than 100 million acres of gallons of water per day for use in irrigation, industrial, and groundwater recharge. But we are all concerned as the lake continues to grow, Los Angeles, and, and so does Orange County and all the way down to San Diego. We need to continue to diversify. What are some of the new types of infrastructure Southern California and other parts of the country would make greater use to prepare for that drought? Thank you, Congresswoman, and, and I think, um, you know, I. Some of the solutions I think were discussed earlier about just being able to manage, again, uh, one of our dams. In Riverside County, we have the Prado Dam, um, which we believe can be used more effectively, could be used more. Um, uh, what, what would you done to Prado Dam to use it more effectively? Uh, you know, we, with FIRO being able to forecast the um, atmospheric rivers and what we call down south the uh, uh, Pineapple Express and making sure that well, we. What are the Army Corps of Engineers able to do to make it uh, work better? just allow for capacity to be larger and manage the discharge so as it, as it flows and it opens up to not have it all discharged in the Pacific Ocean, right? So I think we're trying to serve a dual purpose with the dams. Obviously, it's for public safety and to make sure that there, is, uh, there isn't gonna be a, uh, some catastrophic condition like happened in Oroville, but at the same time, being able to understand the technology, the data, the science, which is really there to be able to allow us to manage it better, and as we evacuate it, to evacuate it so we can capture it as opposed to discharging it into the Pacific Ocean. Well, there's, there's a, a topic that we haven't talked about is uh, the data. Uh, we just don't have enough uh, sources of data to be able to do that. And I think the Army Corps of Engineers is trying. We've given you that we task them with, uh, drought, with water management for uh, uh, the groundwater, the uh, a groundwater recharge. So hopefully uh, we need to hear from you as to where we can do better job with the Army Corps and uh, how we can help uh, manage that. Yeah, and, and we're working with the Scripps Institute and we're also um, understanding what's happening in Lake Mendocino with uh, the Sonoma uh, County District there as well. So we're trying to partner with as many of the knowledgeable folks throughout the state those that have used this uh, science uh, uh, effectively, so hopefully we can use it in, uh, in our part of the state as well. Well, I know that in Southern California, down to San Diego, we are not over the drought. Everybody keeps saying we are, we are not. Maybe Northern California has, but not in Southern California. We haven't replenished the aquifer. We still don't have enough water to be able to say we're out of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, yield back. Thank you, and thank you for the shout out uh, for Sonoma County Water Agency in Lake Mendocino, Mr. Samiento. The chair recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Mr. Egerton, what can you tell us about the uh, sustainable groundwater management uh, law that takes effect in California in 2020? It is uh, an enormous uh, challenge uh, for our agencies, but it really is vested in local government, and that was what we worked to try to try to preserve that space. It's uh, there, the critical, uh, critically overdrafted basins are on the clock to have to finish their sustainability plans by 2020. Well, doesn't it also require taking land out of production? 
Uh, we, it's, you know, all demand and supply side, all, all sides of the equation are going to have to be analyzed. But as I mentioned, if the only solution is to take land out of production, that could be catastrophic well, to our How much land would have to be taken out of production under this law to meet its requirements? It, it, it differs between each, each basin, but I mean, there are estimates of hundreds of thousands of acres potentially could be taken out. And it's, uh, again, it, in, in some areas as much as potentially 25% of the land in certain counties in southern San Joaquin Valley. Uh, that's why we're working so hard to try to find other avenues like the and, and reoperations. Why, why are such draconian measures being proposed? The, Not just proposed, enacted. Yeah, I, I mean, end of the day, the decision on how, that, how they achieve sustainability will be determined at the local level, but I think it's, it's just the, over, uh, the conditions that we've experienced across the state in overdraft and having to address that in some manner. And, but and I, the over, overdraft is because we didn't store enough water in wet years to have plenty in dry ones. Is that accurate? It's uh, certainly, we would like to see a lot more of that, absolutely, more storage to, to help address this challenge. And if we had more storage, and I just talked about 12.6 million acre feet of additional storage from just finishing two dams that we uh, started and never finished and, and constructing a third one that we've been talking about for decades, that's another 12.6 million acre feet of water. Would we be having those problems if we were storing that 12.6 million acre feet? Uh, you know, it would uh, certainly additional storage would absolutely help. We'd still have challenges with being able to convey that to the areas that, that it's in need, and, and that's why it, uh, storage and conveyance have to be part of it. And, and we just well, want to find we, a practical way to course, get there. Of course, that's why we build aqueducts. We build dams to move water from wet years into dry years. We, move, uh, we, we produce aqueducts to move water from wet regions to dry regions. Um, Ms. Hannock, uh, uh, you talked about warmer climate. Warmer climate means uh, uh, less, snow, uh, less precipitation stored in the mountains as snow. If that's the case, doesn't it make sense to build additional storage so that the, the water that cannot be stored as snow can be stored behind a reservoir dam? So it, it absolutely makes sense to expand storage capacity. And what we're highlighting is the importance of thinking about the com combination of the surface reservoirs and the groundwater basins, because in California, that's, there's a tremendous untapped potential to store more water there as well. And surface reservoirs have a real advantage for very quick ability to, to capture and, and release, but for drought storage, for the dry year storage, our groundwater basins have to be a, an important part of that equation as well, because after a few years of drought, even if you got big reservoirs, they get empty. And so you got to be able to rely well, on your uh, groundwater. Uh, groundwater is simply a reservoir underground. Exactly. Right? Essentially. And, and both have, have uh, uh, proven to be the cheapest ways of, uh, of storing water. Uh, the most expensive, of course, being uh, recycling and, uh, and desal. And, and one of the things we're finding, though, is that conveyance is a, is a piece of the equation that folks have to be looking at as well because some of the places that have the most groundwater depletion are places that are really far away from where the water is. Okay, and, well, and let me repeat the, the numbers from the California Energy Commission regarding this, uh, San Diego. $2,300 per acre uh, for desal, $1,500 per acre foot for uh, recycling. Um, importing, $925. Storage, uh, uh, groundwater storage, $737. Uh, cheapest waste surface storage at 600, and that's for San Diego at the end of the pipelines of the systems, uh, uh, and a uh, county that has made an enormous investment in desalination. What I can say, sir, is that the the um, costs vary a lot in different parts of the state of those different solutions, and so a lot of water, ma water managers really look at kind of a risk return portfolio, and recycling can actually be because it's pretty close to drought proof, it, even if it's a bit more expensive, uh, it can be a, a really valuable part of the portfolio the, the as an example. The problem is it's a lot more expensive. What we found is that local communities will do it only if they're given money from the federal government. They won't use their own ratepayer funds because they'd have a ratepayer revolt. Mr. Simanco, uh, let me just go over these numbers again. The, the Carlsbad <laughs> facility cost about a billion dollars. It's estimated that the Shasta raise is about 1.4 billion dollars. Shasta would produce 630,000 acre feet of additional water. Another Carlsbad facility, 56,000. Feet. Um, uh, the uh, energy consumed by uh, Carlsbad uh, is a quarter million, uh, pardon me, a quarter of a megawatt for every uh, acre foot that they produce. A quarter megawatt's enough to uh, 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 power eight, uh, uh, a thousand. Uh, 
quarter megawatt is enough to produce power for 250 homes. Uh, acre foot services one home. Does this make any economic sense? Well, uh, Congressman, um, I'm, I'm interested to, always to hear discussion by my colleagues about different things they're looking at. Uh, desal, for example, doesn't make a lot of sense when you're in Idaho or Wyoming or Colorado because we're not oceanfront. We don't, it'd be an awful long pipeline. Uh, and we've come a long way on reuse, I suppose. We have an annual reuse conference now, but it's primarily our municipal providers that look at that. And I, I hesitate to use this as an example of how we look at reuse in Idaho, but it's just a matter of fact that in the middle of the Minidoka project, there's a place called Connor Cafe, and the sign in the bathroom there says, flush hard, it's a long way to California. So, uh, <laughs> You were doing so well with the Warriors. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm from Idaho, I have to reflect the constituency, <laughs> but no, it, does, it doesn't. The economics are best reflected in Idaho, uh, and to a certain extent in Washington, by the projects that are being implemented there, and, and I, I think perhaps something we lose uh, sometimes in these discussions is that the federal role, while it's important, is limited. Got to take care of the federal infrastructure. Got to improve the federal infrastructure. Got to uh, reduce the red tape. But uh, there is a purposeful and long tradition of deference in the United States, as the U.S. Supreme Court has said, to the states to plan for the allocation of water. And I think we should always keep that foremost in our minds. Thank you. The chair uh, now recognizes himself for the final uh, round of questions. So. Um, I want to clarify something. Um, we may have different philosophical preferences of which of these tools make the most sense to pursue in a 21st century water supply portfolio. Um, but I'm certainly not suggesting, I don't think anyone is ever suggesting that uh, any project that makes sense uh, from a cost benefit analysis shouldn't be on the table and pursued. There may be some new surface storage projects that do that. but. While we're entitled to our own preferences and philosophies, we can't have our own facts. And some things have been suggested that, I, that I've got to uh, clarify a little bit. When we talk about yield from some of these new surface storage projects, and huge numbers are being thrown around, you know, 9 million acre feet. Um, a number was, was uh, stated for Shasta. Uh, a couple of different numbers were thrown out by the ranking member, but um, when it comes to actual yield versus that theoretical storage capacity, the numbers are very, very different. And so, Ms. Hannock, you're an expert on these things. Can you please explain the difference between storage capacity, which in some cases is really large, I mean, you could build a really huge dam that could yield very little water. And that's why we get to some huge cost numbers for most of these new surface storage projects. Uh, could you explain that, please? Sure. So um, when, you, when you build the capacity to, to capture more water behind a, a, a reservoir, then you've got to wait for the water to become, to, to get in there. And so that, that it, now given the amount of storage that we currently... That big new dam doesn't make it rain anymore. It, right. I mean, but it, it can be really useful when it does rain in a year like this. And, you know, some of our reservoirs are up to the brim right now. Um, but so folks look at this over time and they look, okay, what's the average amount of new storage that you're going to uh, get in there and sort of the average yield. So in the case of Shasta, for example, um, the expansion would create a, an additional capacity of about 630,000 acre feet. The average yield is about 50 to 60. Right, a year. and at $1.5 billion to create that average annual yield of a little over 50,000 acre feet, you're suddenly squarely into the recycled water and desalination cost per acre foot, are you not? Well, I'll, I'll say that for we, we looked at this closely for the San Joaquin Valley, which would be the main clients of Shasta um, as part of the Central Valley project, it, it's a bit over $600 an acre foot on average. You know, there are uncertainties, but figure about that. That's more than mo most farmers would be willing to pay for, for water because they pay for water for, as part of their business for, their, for growing their crops. So urban uh, agencies can actually pay more because there's a higher ability to pay um, by, by urban dwellers. But, but I, you make an important point. Yield is the wet water you can actually count on getting. And for water managers, that's what matters. Not some theoretical storage capacity that rarely, if ever, um, is realized. So um, 
There, there's also been a suggestion that there was some uh, halcyon golden age of beneficiary pays water development uh, in the West. Uh, it hasn't really ever worked that way, has it? I mean, the federal government has always subsidized water development through really long repayment periods, 0% interest, uh, in some cases capital obligations that are never repaid. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say that we've never had a pure beneficiary pays system when it comes to federal water development? I would say that the federal government has been a, a financial partner on, on a lot of infrastructure. Um, and uh, that's, my understanding is for Shasta right now, the discussion is, is not about that. It's more about a, a beneficiary pays, possibly with some f financial instruments to help with that. And I but think But some really creative uh, characterizations of public benefit so that those yeah. benefi beneficiaries are being helped out by public dollars. I mean, Potentially. That's what it's all about. Right. And I think, you know, I would just say on the, on the federal financing, in California, it's about 3 or 4% of all water funding is from the federal government. Those dollars are very helpful for a range of projects, and you heard some examples. Um, if they're, the, the most cost-effective ways that the federal government can help through particularly financing instruments of the kind you've been discussing are probably the best ways to, to think about going forward because the, the federal budget is going to be limited um, on, on that. <laughs> um, lest anyone think that Shasta Ray's project is a simple thing, um, technically that project is illegal under California law uh, for over 100 years. Federal projects have deferred to state law, complied with state water laws. Um, the state of California is opposed to that project on record. Um, not a simple proposition. and. Uh, you know, this, this selective concern that kind of comes and goes on the beneficiary pays principle. Um, I just want to point out that uh, the, the ranking member's favorite new, new dam project, Auburn Dam, uh, is six to $10 billion in a, a price tag, according to the Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, that's not a beneficiary pays project at all. It's a massive pile of subsidies if it ever happens, and it's opposed by the local city council, and in fact, um, there's no water right associated th uh, with that. So even if you built that dam, um, you don't have any right to divert water. These are not simple propositions. A lot of these really large controversial surface storage projects, which is why we uh, continue to need to focus on these local projects that are moving, that can continue to move with federal help. Uh, water Smart in Title 16, uh, over the course of the life of these programs have leveraged a three-to-one investment from local and state partners. That's pretty good. When you compare it with transportation infrastructure projects and others, that's really uh, quite a good return for the federal taxpayers. With that, I want to thank the witnesses uh, very much. And Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent to insert in the record the 2018 Municipal Water District of Orange County study on water reliability dated February of 2019. Uh, which concluded under every scenario that the Poseidon uh, desalination plant was the most expensive and most financially risky of the alternative water sources evaluated. Without objection. Uh, so I want to thank the witnesses for this really valuable testimony. This hearing uh, has helped, I believe, the subcommittee understand the current state of Western water infrastructure as well as some opportunities for the future. I was pleased to hear about innovative solutions and financing strategies that we can help promote to advance in all of the above water management and infrastructure strategy. Members of the committee may have some additional witness, uh, questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must submit those questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there's no further business, this uh, committee stands adjourned. Thank you.